Hey, thanks for coming back to the Private Pilot Ground School. Today we're talking about regulations. And the one quick disclaimer I have is regulations are A, not fun, and B, always changing. And so if you watch this video sometime after 2018, make sure you double check that the regulations are still the same as you hear them here. As far as making these regulations fun and easy to understand, I will do my best, I promise. But a lot of this stuff is written by lawyers in such a way that you can't really make it any more fun than it is. The quickest way to find FARs is to type in Federal Aviation Regulations into the search engine of your choice and then go to the FAA website and click on Current Federal Aviation Regulations. That'll take you to this lovely page and Title 14 is Aeronautics and Space and that's where FAA regulations are. Then you can click through chapters and subchapters and find the regulation you're looking for. There's also a search function. There are quite a few apps out there that have the aviation regulations in them. Just make sure you get one where the rules update when the regulations do change. Now the most important question of all of them is what in the world do I have to study because it's a giant book, it's a big publication, what do I have to know for my private pilot certificate? Feel free to pause on this screenshot right here. Part 1 is definitions, part 61 is how you get your license, and part 91 is how you lose it if you don't follow the instructions in part 91. And then the NTSB or part 830 is what happens when somebody screws up. Alright then, let's get the party started. Part 1 of the FARs is definitions and symbols, and I will let you read that. It's kind of like reading a dictionary, and if you're not sure what some of the terms are when you read the FARs, this is the place to look. Part 21.181 talks about the duration of airworthiness certificates. And an airworthiness certificate is something that an airplane gets once it has been made. So the FAA says, yep, good airplane, it flies, here's an airworthiness certificate saying the airplane is airworthy. The certificate is valid as long as aircraft maintenance is performed on the aircraft. And that's basically what Part 21.181 says. As long as required maintenance is performed on the airplane, the airworthiness certificate is valid. Now, it, the FAA doesn't take it away if you, let's say, don't do maintenance for 20 years on the airplane, but the airplane is not flyable. So you have to do all the required maintenance in order for that certificate to become valid again. Part 39.3 is kind of pointless. It's just one little sentence, but it does say that uh, airworthiness directives apply to aircraft engines, propellers, and appliances. Airworthiness directives are things that are unsafe. For example, let's say that Cessna has had issues with their seat sliding back on takeoff because it wasn't locking in place. So the FAA would issue an airworthiness directive saying within the next so many hours or during the next 100 hour or annual inspection, this has to be done to fix the problem. And if you don't comply with the airworthiness directive, your airplane is grounded until the issue has been fixed. If you're an aircraft owner, these are sent to your house and your mechanics will also pull these up when you bring the airplane in for maintenance. Part 43 talks about aircraft maintenance. Who can do it? What do they have to do? All that fun stuff. The important thing for you to know is where to find preventative maintenance. That is in Appendix A of Part 43. And preventative maintenance is a list of things that you yourself can do if you own an airplane that does not require a mechanic sign-off. Part 61.3 says that if you're operating an aircraft as a flight crew member, you need to have a pilot certificate, a photo ID, and a medical certificate in your possession or readily available to you. And you also have to present it if you are requested to by the FAA, the NTSB, uh, a law enforcement officer, or TSA. Don't do drugs, kids. That's what 61.15 is all about. Basically, if you get convicted of a DUI or a DWI, the FAA can suspend, revoke, or deny your application for a certificate. And not only that, you have to submit a written report to the FAA within 60 days of any what they call motor vehicle action. And you can look up what that means at 61.15. I might have mentioned medical certificates in a previous video, but here's a chart showing when you need a medical certificate and for what operation and also how long it's valid. Now there's also a new regulation saying that you could use either a medical certificate or a driver's license as your quote-unquote medical certificate. So you might want to check out 61.23 if that applies to you. Part 61.31 talks about type rating requirements and additional training requirements. A type rating is basically a certification for the make and sometimes model of the airplane. So for example, you can get a Boeing 737 type rating that will allow you to fly 737 aircraft. 
Now, why do you need it? You need it for three reasons. One, the FAA says so. Two, it's a turbojet, meaning it's a turbine engine. Or three, it's a large aircraft or over 12,500 pounds. So if you wanted to fly the Cirrus Vision Jet, you will need a type rating because it's a jet. There are some other certifications and endorsements you need, one of them being for a complex airplane. You'll need that when you do your commercial training, that's for a retractable gear and a constant speed prop, that's a complex endorsement. You will also need a high performance endorsement at some point, and that's for anything over 200 horsepower. And if you want to fly tailwheel airplanes, that's also another endorsement. Part 61 decimal 56 talks about flight reviews. Your license never expires, but to keep it current, you have to do a flight review every 24 calendar months. A flight review is a minimum of one hour flight and one hour ground instruction. During that time, you will review part 91, which is flight rules, and you will also discuss and maybe do some of the maneuvers and procedures that your instructor thinks you need to do to show them that you are a competent pilot. Things like steep turns, for example. The one neat thing about flight training is that if you do a check ride, it resets your flight review. Flight reviews are due every 24 calendar months, but if you do a check ride somewhere in those 24 calendar months, you have 24 more calendar months after the check ride date to complete your flight review. So that's kind of cool. Ah, the good old 6157. Recent flight experience for the pilot in command, or as I like to call it, currency. Once you get your private pilot certificate, you are free to rent or fly any airplane that you are certified for. Now there's no issue with that if you want to get in and fly by yourself. However, if you do want to carry passengers, that's where this comes in. If you do want to carry passengers and act as pilot in command of that airplane, you have to perform at least three takeoffs and landings within the preceding 90 days. If you want to carry passengers at night, that means from one hour after sunset until one hour before sunrise, you also have to do three takeoffs and landings within the 90 days, but they have to be to a full stop. The only couple caveats are one, you have to be the sole manipulator of the controls, meaning that you can't let your instructor fly it and land three times for you. And you have to be in the same category, class, and type if it's required. Now, category means airplane, rotorcraft, glider, lighter than air, etc. Class means single engine, multi-engine, etc. So you're flying an airplane and it's probably a single engine. All your landings have to be in a single engine airplane. Also, if you're flying a tailwheel airplane, all those landings have to be to a full stop day or night. If you change your permanent address, the FAA wants to know within 30 days. If you would like to find the address where to send your change of address to, that will be found in Part 61, Decimal 60. Part 61, Decimal 95 gives you permission to do something kinda dumb, but if you are a student in a Class Bravo airspace and you want to fly in and out of that Class Bravo airspace, or maybe do takeoffs and landings at a giant Class Bravo airspace, you can do that. But first, you have to get flight and ground instruction from an instructor, they have to endorse you, and the endorsement has to be within the past 90 days, and that's pretty much it. Personal two cents, don't do it. It's big and scary, and you're just a student pilot. Go like five miles away and fly into something smaller. So you get your private pilot certificate. What are some things that you can't do with it? The one most important thing is you cannot fly for hire. If anybody is paying you to fly, you are flying for hire. There is an exception to the hire rule and it says if it's incidental to your business, it doesn't count as for hire. Let's say you're a realtor and you need to show a house in another state. If you hop on your airplane and you fly over there, your primary business is not flying airplanes, it's selling houses. So the flight would be incidental, it wouldn't be considered for hire technically. The most important part of this regulation is what's called prorata share. If you take somebody flying with you, let's say you and three of your friends, so there's four of you, you take a 172 and you go flying for a day, and the fuel, oil, the rental fees, and everything, they come out to $400. You can split it four ways and each of you pay $100. Prorata share means that the pilot in command cannot pay any less than the equal share of the fuel, oil, rental, etc. So I was very naive and I thought I could do all of the regulations in one stinking video, but you know what? There's a lot of them and I can't cover them all at once. So this video was just part 61 basically and some of the other parts in the beginning. Next video we'll try to cover all part 91, hopefully that works out, and maybe finish up the regulations. So thanks for sticking around, I hope this was interesting or you learned something. Please let me know in the comments how you think this video went, whether it was too dry, too boring, and I will see you in the next one. Until then, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning.